Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, that was an amazing talk. Uh, I'm not sure always how to pronounce your first name. It's Bujans, right? Is that close? No, it's not, John. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are just silent J, silent J, but five points for trying. Five points for trying. Five points for trying. Okay. Hello, Vinny. How's it going? Hey, John. Very well. Thank you. Thanks for hosting Good. us today. Yeah, I'm excited to moderate this. Um, so, you know, the general summary for today is how do we overcome prioritization challenges? And so what we're going to try to dig in is to specific examples of how in your organization you approach prioritization. Obviously, prioritization is not just one capability. It's also a combination of research. It's a combination of communication, as we just saw. It's a combination of strategy. So there's many things involved in that. And so we're going to uh, rotate through the panelists get a few prioritization frameworks or approaches uh, as we go through. And I guess very briefly, I'm not sure. So Vinny, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Vinny. Um, I'm currently a product design manager at Zendesk. Um, I'm working nice. on the, the Zendesk platform. Um, I've been there for about 18 months or so. I'm in that role mm -hmm. working on, on one of our platform teams. Nice. Fellow Zendesk person. I also worked at Zendesk a while ago, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, Did I didn't know that. So maybe maybe you've got some insight into how it was a few years ago. It'll be interesting to see if it's uh, changed. Yeah, much. we could go through the, um, yeah, we should go through that. And okay, so we've had some intros before. You were able to introduce yourself now, Vinny. That's good as we continued off that conversation. So I think, first of all, I think a lot of times people equate prioritization to prioritizing ideas. <laughs> now, we could talk about whether that's the right way to go about it, whether we should prioritize leverage points or whether we should prioritize objectives. But certainly ideas are a big part of it. There's a bunch of people have ideas. And so I think one question would be, Vinny, maybe you could start is, where do ideas come from in your organization? Where do they spring from? And what do you do with them <laughs> uh, when they come up? Yeah, maybe you could talk through where do the ideas come from? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I definitely think, you know, there's a lot of challenges with prioritizing things. I don't think a shortage of ideas is, is ever the problem. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. We have plenty of different feedback rolling in through, through different channels. So if I think to things like our, our customers are telling us things every day and whether that's... Yeah. The design team in a user interview, whether it's to our sales team, whether it's our advocacy team who are doing product support and product managers have no shortage of ideas, engineers yeah. have no shortage of ideas. So we tend to see kind of ideas come from everywhere, whether it's internally or externally. I think yeah. I think you're right, though. The challenge is then, well, what what do you do with all those that information coming in? Like, how do you actually make some sense of that? And I think that's where it comes to kind of formalizing some of those channels. So for example, right. like having a, a voice of a customer program in place so that all the stuff that we're hearing from our customer success teams, like rather yeah. than bringing, you know, a hundred bits of different feedback to the product team, maybe you have somebody kind of summarize that and kind of bullet, what, what are the key points or what are the key themes coming through that, that we might be able to address? And that's also then on us to actually have some kind of loop in place where we can take in that yeah. feedback and respond to it as well. So I think the the ideas I would say just come from everywhere in the organization, and that could be inside, but but then outside with our customers and partners as well. Nice. In some ways, I would also think that ideas are data in their own way. They're just they're sort of encapsulated insights from people. Often people express it as an idea, but there's something behind it. So, yeah, like flipping over at Microsoft maybe a big different situation than uh, Zendesk, but yeah, where do ideas come from? Um, how do you process them? How do you extract insights maybe from them? How do you, yeah, where do they come from? Yeah, and in an incredibly big organization that has many other kind of organizations in it. So for, for anyone who's interested, my version, how I see Microsoft is there is the product group, there's Microsoft yeah. Research, MSR, and then there's what is sort of the customer-facing aspects of, of Microsoft, which is the world in which I work and, and occupy. So similar to Descendes, product would, group would have a lot of user feedback forums, a very 
um, mature design and research approach with potential uh, people who are going to be part yeah. of product experiences. For um, Microsoft Research, I mean, we're talking about people who who it's it's their day in day out existence to have yeah. ideas <laughs> or ideas. When it comes to customer facing work, uh, ultimately customer ha has come to us with the motivation to use some of the language from the from the presentation, with a motivation to achieve something specific for them. And in in doing that, um, I guess we sort of see different qualities from that customer. Are they really mature in in terms of yep. the idea yep. that they have come to us with, or are they looking for some kind of leadership around, or less leadership, but just a a, a sounding board or a, a guidance on how to go about exploring it further, so that it gets to the point of of maturity that it needs to be at. And I would, so I would say that in, in that situation, most definitely the inception of the idea has come from the customer. What has influenced them in that idea is a myriad of things, right? There is the, the entire yeah. milieu that, that we all live in, them being exposed to advertisements or to ideas within their own industry. And then it's a matter of at a project level, how we engage with them to work that project, that idea through to you know, whatever stage it needs to be. It needs to be matured. Two. Right. I love that description that it's just not as simple as I've got an idea, we can build that. And there's probably some folks who are listening that in their particular organization, it is, you know, the battle of ideas, you know, who's who gets the first best pitch or not. But as you can see in an organization like Microsoft or Zendesk, that ideas exist in this whole other context of teams that are working with it. And so, yeah, that's interesting. So I think one, as we're thinking about that, that is there, so I'm, I could go either way about frameworks in the sense that a lot of people believe that uh, when it comes to prioritization, uh, they'll Google prioritization frameworks and then up will pop one of these five frameworks. And then suddenly uh, you'll figure it out and you'll be able to prioritize all these ideas. I, I'm skeptical having been on the ground on teams that the frameworks provide that level of certainty, but I do think that they can provide a level of rigor to your thinking um, and more importantly, probably get the right conversations to happen. So I was wondering, Vinny, at Zendesk at the moment, do you use any specific frameworks specifically for prioritization? Uh, if so, do you modify them in any way? And then how do you, you know, make sure that the framework works for you instead of you working for the framework? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a, I think it's a really good question. Um, certainly there's a few frameworks that we use at Zendesk. Um, I can also recall the last company I worked for was a larger content software company. And we use, like, I remember the cost of delay framework. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that yeah. framework that, that we used yeah. to use a lot. Um, and what I saw, especially like initially you looked at it and people would present things and they would present their cost of delay and, you know, oh, we, we need to do feature A over feature B because look at this cost of delay. Then when you get into the weeds, people were just gaming the system to make their pet project win. So I think that's something when I when I think about those frameworks as well, I, you know, it's great to put numbers on things and people love assigning numerical values to things. Um, right. <laughs> but it, it it doesn't always make sense and it's pretty easy to, to kind of fudge some of those numbers. So I guess um, our approach today, so that's something I've been exposed to, like from a higher level in the company, there's certainly things yeah. like OKRs that we use. So yeah. they very much come from the, the top down and they're set at that organization level. Um, in other companies I've worked in, those OKRs cascade the whole way down into individual teams. I would yeah. say for us, it's, it's probably not, like, not to the same effect at Zendesk. So we have these broader OKRs that we're trying to hit as a company, but within our yeah. product teams, we've got a bit more flexibility in terms of how we're actually going to hit those metrics. And I think yeah. in terms of frameworks within different teams, then you will, you will see slight variations of frameworks used. So yep. it, it's not an exact science and there's certainly some, you know, we've got product ops teams who are very much trying to, to standardize that across the organization right. so that there's some level, but I mean, trying to get, you know, um, and it's, you know, we're nowhere near even the size of Microsoft, but um, <laughs> an organization with 5,000 employees and, you know, hundreds of, of product teams, it's really hard to get everybody using the exact same framework. And I don't even necessarily right. know that you're going to get the right outcome from everybody using the exact same framework. So certainly um, something that will change, will change team to team a little bit. Yeah. I love that, that point too, about mono process. You know, we think that consistency is, 
good, but it really could be that the best outcome is the best outcome for customers. <laughs> and if a team is using something that works for them in that particular context, who's to argue, right? <laughs> to do, do that particular thing. Yeah. So yeah. um Buanis, what were you, what at Microsoft, are there any sort of canonical frameworks that everyone has to understand like the back of their hand or are there, is there a ton of variation between groups when it comes to prioritize, uh, prioritization? Within, within the area that I'm in, most definitely there is a uh, uh, difference. There, there isn't one set method. Echo it much of what Vinny has said, actually, there's, there's not a great deal of difference to what he said within, within Microsoft. Mm. Um, we're also rolling out objectives and key results at, a, at an organisational level. Uh, that, that has not filtered down into as an individual, here's what, what you must do in order to do it. I, I would hope that that wouldn't happen, actually, because people need autonomy and you most definitely want to invite serendipity. You want to invite someone to creatively mm. interpret something because with that, without that, you will never achieve also that other elusive thing of innovation or, or at least doing things differently and better to what a framework right. at the point in time that it was created or what a, a set of objectives were aiming to achieve will inevitably be out of date at the end of, uh, you know, choose any time in, in the future. <laughs> yeah, I wonder too that I think about the conversations that happen with these frameworks when people just copy even even, oh, we're going to do OKRs now. And if you think about the context within, within which OKRs emerged at Google or any other organization, that it could be, I, I talked to so many teams and many of these things are used in a very unique way depending on the organization. So there is that element to, um, it's kind of the, local, the, the localizing these methods, I guess, for your particular techniques to do that. We do have a question. Um, was there any... Uh, Gamed numbers. We'll get to numbers in a second. Yeah, I think we'll get to the numbers. Um, when I, I'm wondering to maybe, maybe this is one way to help people think about prioritization, but at what level do you prioritize? You know, so one, one could argue, well, prioritization is happening up and down the stack, right? Like at some point, someone is saying, there's that slide with the three to four pillars on it. You have to have that. And that is a form of prioritization in itself. Hopefully you don't have 17 of them, but, uh, you know, ideally that there's something there. And then you could go from that to sort of um, where are teams going to spend the next 12 to 18 months to focus, you know, just a broad um, swath of focus all the way down to the sort of backlog or things like that. Um, Vinny, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe you wanted to take a, a, a quick stab at that is if you kind of work down the stack of these, you know, from the pillars down to the things like when does it happen? How often does it change? Can you take a stab at that? I think it would help folks out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, yeah, this has been interesting to be working in different organizations with different approaches to this. Um, again, the, the last organization I worked for they really went through these big three-year plans. So everything was like a three-year plan. Now the three-year plan didn't mean like we've, we've decided every roadmap item for the next three years. It was just like some really big high level kind of targets around maybe it was seizing the enterprise or, or hitting a particular revenue goal. Right. But it was very consistent through the three years. Like you'd have slight variations, mm -hmm. but it, it would always be through three years. It was internal branding and all that kind of stuff were on the plan. Um, at Zendesk, I think it's much more on a, I think 12 months is, is probably the, the time frame for really properly reassessing everything and really yep. kind of checking in, of, is this the right direction? That 12 months, so every 12 months, there'll kind of be a, a, a big bang almost. Like often that's kind of lined up with, with product marketing as well, where, where we'll actually have right. events and, and kind of talk about releases. In the product teams, though, I think we're very focused quarter to quarter. So right. a lot of our kind of rituals are focused on, hey, what's happening in the next quarter? How did the last quarter go? Like we'll have yeah. mid-quarterly check-ins where we're checking in kind of mid-quarter, but it's we really talk about quarters a lot. So when we're kind of talking about prioritizing work and where different projects fits in, it, it's very much on that quarterly basis. Um, to kind of, to go back to the, maybe more the heart of the question though, we we'll kind of have these kind of annual plans and there'll be some broader OKRs for the company. And then typically there'll be for the product team, there'll be some key focuses and asks of the product team. So this year, like here is the five things that, that we want the product team to be focused on. And Got it. different teams will kind of get assigned to those, to those different areas. 
And within the teams, then you've got a real clear goal that's been set from, from the higher ups in the business, but it's really up to you then to actually start prioritizing, you know, gathering the bits of work, prioritizing roadmaps, kind of looking at what are we going to do in Q1 versus Q2 and, and actually, you know, as you said, starting to talk about like backlogs and, and managing the work at that kind of level. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Blanis, I was wondering for you, especially with the research background, um, Maybe we could even take a twist there too, in the sense that sometimes, you know, research is informing prioritization, but then you have prioritization happening at multiple horizons mm. at once. And so I'm wondering, you know, what's the, you know, the, as, as you kind of saw how Vinny did, if you work down the stack of mm. the resolutions that you're thinking at, and maybe where, how research might be informing those particular levels, how do you think about it for in your particular group at Microsoft? Is it the five-year plan all the way down to what's going on in the day-to-day -day or how does it work? A slightly different context because we're working with customers on their products or their right. solutions or their experiences. Yeah. So what I typically see is an average of a one-year product plan for customers who have mm -hmm. products in market that we're then helping them with or we're, right. we're doing a piece of work on. So that means that uh, what, what's difficult in that situation is if they have a desire to, while this product has a one-year commitment, if they're then wanting to do some parallel work around uh, exploration phase of something that could be a game changer yeah. for that product, yeah. we, are, we, we need to be very mindful of the time of the costs associated with that product that is already committed to a one-year time right. plan. You know, those, those product yeah. managers have already settled on the people that they'll have in their team, the, the variety of skill sets required, the disciplines, et cetera. But at the same time, they want to simultaneously run this parallel piece of work. So there's always a little bit of a, a tango around managing that. In yeah. terms of uh, where, it, where there's sort of, let's say, an innovation group or a, a, a group with an organisation that has been carved out in order to achieve a particular new thing within that organization. So it might not actually be a product yet. Right. In, yeah. that, in that instance, um, we're working day to day and we're, uh, the, the thing that we're always aiming for is to, of course, ensure that research starts ahead right. of any engineering work. And yeah. even though, I mean, there's, there's some things to talk about in that because there are fundamentals that can be put in place. So there are moments in time where you could run two tracks in parallel. You just need to be, I, I guess, very aware to catch that moment in time that to ensure that people aren't continually continuing on those tracks in parallel, but that there are these moments of connection in planned in by design throughout rather than that default position. If you start out one way, it's very hard for people to, kind of question and get off that track. So being intentional about designing in those meeting points is, is a requirement in that kind of a situation. Yeah, I love that description too, because again, it's people, if, if you're new to product or anything, you imagine you're just sort of force ranking a backlog and that's the degree of prioritization, but it is really a lot more dynamic than that. And you're prioritizing at different levels and you're using research to sort of diverge and then converge where you're going. But in your example too, the team's established. So someone has placed a bet. They've prioritized some kind of opportunity that exists at that point. Otherwise, the people wouldn't necessarily be there. And so it is kind of very interesting to hear about how it's happening at these different resolutions. I'm curious about the, the input of how things have been working back into prioritization. So one thing we notice a lot at Amplitude is that people, they get extremely focused on using data to maybe think about the opportunity space and then maybe think about the various problems that exist and then maybe think about how to design their solutions or their particular bet. And they spend a lot of time focusing on that and then they ship it and then they never go back and look at it again. And so there's not, they're not closing the loop of prioritization back into that. And so that can be qualitative as well. It can be quantitative. There's many, there's many ways to keep that loop going. And I was wondering, Vinny, when you're thinking about uh, how you prioritize at Zendesk, is it product ops who's essentially trying to cast the net for the various, and, and that, and I guess UXR and other groups are trying to cast the net for the qualitative feedback. Yeah, but how, how are you inputting back into the prioritization based on how stuff is doing? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And, you know, I think 
certainly in every team that I've worked in, it's, it's always been a real struggle to, to really give as much time as you really want to, to go back over some of that stuff again. Um, I think, yeah. as you said, like there's this bias towards <clears throat> shipping the new shiny thing. And then once it's shipped, it's, you know, we talk about V2, 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 and then V2 just, right. just never happens. So it, yeah. <laughs> it's certainly always been a challenge. Um, something that I think, and look, I, I certainly don't think we've solved it. Um, whenever we're releasing things, we want to be really clear about what our success metrics look like, but also then like, what is, what is the path to getting customer feedback? So for example, mm -hmm. if we're working on something like right now, our team's working on something which is going to be a beta release. And before we actually want to put that to general availability, there's a few gates that's going to have to pass through. And therefore, when it actually becomes generally available, it's going to have satisfied a certain bar that we're really comfortable with. So we're able to get yeah. that, that feedback from people before it's actually generally available to, to the population. Um, again, yeah. that, that's not perfect in itself because what happens if, you know, it, it takes a really long time to get there. Maybe we just can't hit those metrics. Maybe we still move on to something else. So yeah. it's, it's certainly a, a really tough one to, to be really robust. Um, another thing I think is worth mentioning, something I think about a lot is we often talk, you know, MVP, MLP, like the, the phrase of the day. <laughs> I often think about what if we never came back to iterate on this thing? Like what if we released this into our product and what if we got moved on to something else? Like, is this something we're happy to live for another five years? Because yeah. in reality, <laughs> that's, that's what's going to happen a lot of the time. So that that's not a that's not a, a framework there's no number on that but it, it can help in some of those conversations about you know should we do that extra little bit of work it's like well look yeah. if we put a few more weeks into this like maybe we're comfortable if if we get pivoted onto something else yep i love that too because prioritization is happening all the time you know i read recently that an engineer or designer makes a cost benefit decision every 15 minutes and so we think of prioritization as sort of deciding at the high level what to do, but you're prioritizing where to spend your time. You're priori prioritizing like, oh my God, we, we were a week late. I mean, should we spend another week or two on it? So it really is happening all the time. Um, and I love that you extended it to that. And then you carving out that space for the feedback loops, ideally uh, to do that. Um, Buhanis, I was wondering for you, what role does the feedback loop play in prioritization decisions, either on where to go next, or maybe as you're working with these customers. I always think with we deal with a lot of um, consulting firms at Amplitude who use Amplitude for their customers. And they always say, they always describe an example where they do these excellent startup activities with the, the executives of the company. It feels very organic, very participatory design. There's a vision. And then it gets to shipping the thing. And they're already a couple months in and they have the stickies all over the wall and suddenly things, they never go back to that. So they get into such delivery mode to do that. Mm. And so I'm curious, like, how do you, maybe extending that, you know, you've got a lot of research going into it. You have a lot of assumptions, a lot of hypotheses about what's going to work out. And you want this customer of yours to be successful too at what they're doing. How do you even encourage them to think about getting this out there potentially early enough to be able to have enough cycles before maybe that year is up that you have with them? Um, it's tough sometimes, right? <laughs> so it's really tough. And it kind of goes to the that third area of the the you know soliloquy that I had for half an hour before <laughs> this, which was around motivation design or persuasive design, that it, it is. It's a reality of the of the world that we live in that on one hand there's so much marketing that uh, espouses how quick it is for a piece of technology to be deployed. So you have a right. group of executives who hear that <laughs> and have been trained in this mode of thinking fast, quick, and cheap, uh, fast, quick, and cheap. And the Silicon Valley mantra of move fast and break things is terrible we have to bury these notions they are so <laughs> problematic and particularly I can't underscore the point enough of how problematic it is to take such a notion and apply it to the world of artificial intelligence um, in terms of that ongoing negotiation that's 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 a fact and that's a, that's part of the reality that right you need to kind of start out being clear and you have a responsibility to be clear about what that research program is going to look like, what it's going to do, and find, compel people to see that there's a need for it. And I, I love the fact that more watchdogs are demanding that standards are, are in this place, are going to be implemented in this space. 
and then and then the, the the work proper happens and everybody does get into delivery mode and you just you really need a very mature team to understand how they each need to work for each other it also is not helpful if you have again going back to the idea of these separate tracks if you have an engineering team or you have a data science team that isn't appreciative of working with other disciplines then what they're right. going to be saying to a customer will be setting the expectation that you only need to think myopically. So important for everyone to be there to support each other and knowing how that even needs to come out in the words that are being expressed in the space of a meeting when perhaps your discipline isn't being represented in that, that meeting. Yep. I've strayed a little bit, recognize it to, to your no, question. No, no, but I think that this is part of it too, because you get the, you know, the one part of the team. I mean, I even remember being at Zendesk myself or wherever, you know, one part of the team actually was lined up to really do sort of rigorous follow-up on this thing and to keep it moving. And, you know, meanwhile, in the product manager's lens, it's just like, well, I, it's it's the sort of bait and switch. I always make the joke that the product manager at night goes and just flips the feature flag switches and just gets it out to everyone. And then, you know, oh, I'm sorry, last night I was getting a little tired and I decided to release it to all the customers to do this thing. Um, cool, we have a couple minutes left. I was hoping, you know, maybe thinking about um, when you've observed teams, Vinny, what's the, what's the biggest prioritization trap in your mind? What's the one that even you've caught yourself doing, but you just, you observe over and over and over again. Um, yeah, where do people often go wrong that you wanna leave them some actionable advice about trying not to go wrong there? Yeah, that, that uh, it comes to mind really quickly, which means that it's probably <laughs> something I see a lot. Um, I think there's a couple of parts to it. I think one is just a bias, a bias to features over outcomes and a mm. bias to really just like, and especially when you're an expert, it's easy to, to jump and think that you know best and kind of assume that you are your customer and, and that you're thinking the right things for them. So I think seeing um, priorities or things on a list to prioritize that are actually not outcomes, but just like feature A, feature B, feature C. Um, yeah. And I think, I think as well, as part of that, like people that have been around, say, a long time, it's almost like they have a vision for what the product's going to be and they just want to kind of execute on, on what their vision is. And the priority is like, hey, here's 10 things to execute my vision. Like how do we, how can we stack rank my vision as opposed to like being something that's much more flexible and, and kind of outcomes focused. And I love the framing and you've mentioned it a few times of opportunities, like an opportunity yeah. backlog. Um, that, that kind of language I think is much better than just, you know, like, feature list or, or whatever else we might call it. So yeah, that kind of bias towards features and, and maybe people just executing on visions as opposed to properly looking for feedback. Yeah, that's great. I would think that that's exactly like mine where it's, you know, th this quest for ultimate certainty instead of saying, that's a really powerful opportunity. We might try a dozen times and miss the mark on that. Or, you know, there might be, it, it might take us, you know, 12 to 18 months Long, but that's what we want. So the difference between prioritizing at that level to playing this sort of inane feature Tetris, you know, is it going to take, if, if you're trying to decide between five or 10 days to take something, you're in the wrong game. You know, that, that's like a hard yeah. game to say that. Um, oh, it says, okay, we can wrap up anytime. Uh, Bohannes, what's, what quickly, what's your big prioritization? Uh, gotcha. Uh, I, I think just if, if people were more explicit about something that's in intuition driven versus uh, data driven or insights driven. And by data, I don't mean numbers necessarily. Uh, obviously, very much a supporter of, of qualitative data when it comes to getting an understanding of the needs. That was yeah. quick, John. Quick. No, no, I think that that, well... And your that's, request. That's, like be, ex be explicit about it. That's what I think too, is if it is a sort of intuition focused thing, I think that some people wrap that around this sort of faux rigor, like yeah. faux quantitative and, and rigor. Intuition when it really is okay. Yeah. yeah. Intuition yeah. is okay. Like, but let's just be is, honest so about it. Right. Exactly. To do that. So this was great. I was really happy to moderate this with you all, um, hearing stories from Vinny and Bohannes. Um, yeah, this was a wonderful thing. Uh, yeah. Prioritize some opportunities next week. Uh, and get out of the feature Tetris game and you'll be in good shape. There you go.